Hello everyone, this is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific and tonight with me is David Levy. Now, David Levy, as many of you know, is, he's a world-renowned astronomer, comet discoverer, uh, author, uh, astronomy outreach advocate. Um, he's been all over the world giving lectures and uh, has had many experiences from uh, you know, the discovery of his comets to working with uh, professional astronomers uh, for various projects, doing incredible things for amateur astronomers, especially f with a focus on children to learn astronomy uh, because it's one of the great gateway sciences. Um, tonight his program is called uh, the, Le the Lyrid Meteor Shower, The Night Sky, and Poetry. Now David often gives, uh, uh, will add poetry to his, his programs, but uh, you know, with a lot of people that do uh, lectures in astronomy, I would say that uh, David is one of the most poetic. Heck, he's even saying it some of his uh, uh, presentations, which I was, uh, I really love that. So that was really great. Um, I put into the announcement, David, that uh, about uh, the fact that uh, someone from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, now we have to go into the Wayback Machine, back to 1968, and you had a disagreement with one of the, with one of the senior officials of the uh, RASC. And he said, David, you will never amount to anything. You know, he made this prediction. <laughs> and later on, of course, David goes on to discover over 23 comets, uh, writing nearly 40 books on astronomy, uh, appearing on television, special programs, special science programs. Uh, you know, he, is, uh, has, he has been one of the most productive uh, amateur astronomers in the world, and I am very, very proud to call him my friend, and I'm very happy to have him on our show tonight. So thank you, David. Okay, well, is it, is it my turn now? <laughs> yeah, it's all for you now. <laughs> okay, thanks, Scotty. Yeah. These late eclipses in the sun and moon pretend no good to us. Though the wisdom of nature can reason it less and less, yet nature finds itself scourged by the sequent effects. Love cools, friendship falls off, and brothers divide. In cities, mutinies. In countries, discord. And in palaces, treason. This is the excellent foppery of the world that when we are sick and fortune, we make guilty of our disasters the sun the moon and the stars. If any of you wonder what this opening quote comes from, it actually comes from Shakespeare's greatest play, King Lear. And when I was at Acadia in my third year back in 1970, we actually studied King Lear. And I had the book and it was open. And I even marked down those, those, um, those, those passages these late eclipses in the sun and moon. And they just went over me like just one one to another. There was like there was no absolutely no no uh, official mention made that William Shakespeare was writing about astronomy. Not just a couple of words, but two full pages in his life. That didn't happen until quite later, and I will tell you the story of that soon. But when I was about 15 years old, I was a patient at the Jewish National Home for Asthmatic Children. <clears throat> and I was very interested at the time in astronomy, a subject that my father, at the time, was trying to get me out of, even though he had the same interest in astronomy that I had. Anyway, I went outside one night to look at the Lyrid meteors. I got outside and I saw one meteor, and then a great big fat cloud came by and covered the telescope, which isn't this one, but it covered the telescope, it covered me, and I couldn't see any more. The next couple of nights later, I went out again, and I'm looking out again, and guess what? I'm, uh, I didn't see anything. And I wrote in my diary, this is the most disappointing failure I have ever had. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I have had many finer failures since then. 
many, many finer failures that I've had since that point, including one that Scotty mentioned in his introduction. <clears throat> and uh, so now we fast forward past my years at Acadia. And, uh, and I'm supposed to, it, the computer now wants me to stop what I'm doing and upgrade my Avast. I'm wondering if all the people would mind if I stopped the talk <laughs> and upgraded my Avast. Well, I'm going to say the heck with that. <clears throat> anyway, I'm out there, and uh, the year is now 1976. I'm engaged to what Wendy and I now call my practice wife, that, who was my then fiancé. We went to the observatory of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, sat outside, and were watching meteors. And it was a clear Friday night, and we saw quite a few meteors that night. And I got quiet, and I was sitting down, looking up at the sky, and I'm thinking, I wonder how many other people have seen shooting stars who were not as interested in astronomy, and they got them interested in the night sky. People like uh, other amateur astronomers. People like me, who started with astronomy at a summer camp when I was eight years old, and I saw a shooting star approaching the star Vega. And then I thought another thought, not just astronomers. I'm about to go to Queen's University to get my master's degree, and I'm wondering if any other people actually, people who weren't just astronomers, but writers, poets, playwrights like Shakespeare, were able to get inspired to improve their poetry through the night sky. And it just suddenly hit me. And the, the uh, quote from King Lear, these late eclipses in the sun and moon, suddenly became a very powerful message for me. Hmm. That astronomy, the message really had very little to do with either astronomy or literature. The message was that astronomy tells you about the human condition. It tells us about life. It tells us about what kind of, of, of life we have here on this planet. <clears throat> and uh, who knows what poetry and other things we might be able to find out. Anyway, the very next day, we went to uh, Kingston. We took a train to Kingston, and we got off, and I met Dr. Norman McKenzie. And I told him about the Lear meteor shower from the night before. And I asked him uh, <clears throat> if that was, um, if it was possible that people, that other poets, other than Shakespeare, had been inspired by a look at the night sky. At the time, I had not, no idea that Shakespeare might have observed the supernova of 1572 uh, when he was eight years old. Uh, I can't imagine that he wouldn't have seen it. I cannot imagine that his father or his mom wouldn't have taken him out back <clears throat> and shown him the night sky with this extremely bright star, brighter than Venus, visible in daylight, shining from the north. Mm. So I, I asked Dr. McKenzie, and uh, he said, uh, he said, well, actually, there is. And uh, he said it's his favorite poet, Gerard Manley Hopkins. Now, how many of you have heard of Gerard Manley Hopkins, a poet Whose, work, whose writings are almost impossible to read, almost impossible to make sense of. Some of us might have studied Hopkins in high school, the Windover, Dapple, Dawn, Drawn, all of this stuff that is almost impossible to understand. Hopkins was one of the toughest poets 
I've ever studied until I found this one. Hopkins was a very young man at the time, about as old as I was when I was at Acadia. He was um, looking at the night sky and he saw a comet in the sky. It was probably comet, one of Tuttle's comets. And he read in the paper, in the Illustrated London News, or maybe even the London Times, because both publications had the same information. It said, on Monday next, the comet will be situated midway between the star Iota in Orga and Beta in Taurus. Two weeks later, he wrote this poem, and I read it, and I'm going to read it to you right now. I am like a slip of comet, scarce worth discovery, in some corner seen, bridging the slender difference of two stars, come out of space, or suddenly engendered by heavy elements, for no man knows. But when she sights the sun, she grows and sizes, and spins her skirts out, while her central star shakes its cocooning mists, and so she comes to fields of light, millions of traveling rays pierce her. She hangs upon the flame-cased sun, and sucks the light as full as Gideon's fleece. But then her tether calls her, she falls off, and as she dwindles, sheds her smock of gold amidst the sistering planets and then goes out into the cavernous dark. So I go out, my little sweet is done. I have drawn heat from this contagious sun to not ungentle death, now forth I run. Years later, Norman Mackenzie gave a lecture at Queen's about Hawkins and he got to that poem and he stopped his lecture and he said, I have to admit, that I have never in my life met anyone who was more enthusiastic about a work of literature than David was about Hopkins and his comic poem. It was incredible. <clears throat> it was partly trying to figure out which comedy he was talking about. I know now it was the Comet of 1864, but at the time I was working on it, I had no idea. Could it have been Donati's Comet from 1858? No, that's too far back. How about the Great Comet of 1861? And uh, Tennyson, in fact, wrote about showing it to his children from the marketplace during the summer of 1861. It would be nice if we had a, uh, a bright summer comet. Scotty, do you think there's a chance we might have a bright summer comet this year? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think that um, we haven't had one for a long time, you know, so maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe there's, is there a law in the United States that we're not allowed to have any more comets? <laughs> there's lots of laws in the United States, so it could be, could be. You know, you have uh, you sent me a beautiful image of uh, Comet Neowise. I'm going to show that here for a moment. Here it is. Uh, you shot that uh, yesterday morning. Is that right? Yes, I did. You want to tell us a little bit about this? I was inside then. It was the whole idea of uh, of a nice summer comet. There's nothing like it in the world to go out just after dawn. And you look to the northeast, you see Capella, you take your pair of binoculars, you go down a little from Capella and a little bit to the left, and there you have this magnificent comet with a bifurcated tail. It's gorgeous. Hmm. So if any of you are into it in the next couple of mornings, get up right about dawn, actually a little bit after dawn starts, you have to let Capella get fairly high, uh, and then you just go drop down from Capella, a little to the left, and then you'll see the comet. It's gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. And I estimated its brightness the other day as zero, 
and other people have said it's one or two even, but it's brighter than that. The reason I know it's brighter than that is that you're comparing the brightness of a comet to the brightness of a fixed star, and the star is just a point of light, even though it may be bright. Capella is about zero. The comet is way spread out with the tail and everything, but if you took all that and put it together into one point of light, it would be at least as bright as Capella is. It's a magnificent comet. Please go out and take a look at it and uh, post your pictures on Facebook. We have a lot of pictures there now, and uh, we're going to have a lot more, but this is a winner. This comet is beautiful. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I uh, kind of think when I see a comet that bright about the um, about the cosmic connection that it has, about the idea that we may not be alone in the universe. Last night, mm. I cheated myself to Carl Sagan's last major work, his movie Contact. And uh, it lasted way too long. I didn't get to sleep until way past 2.30 in the morning. And, but the whole idea of being able to take a look at a comet, a comet like, like that, and uh, wonder, are there any people on other planets seeing their own comets at this time? Are there any people living on other worlds? And we know now that there are thousands upon thousands of other planets in the sky, some of which could be in the life zone that could conceivably support life. And I always wonder what those people are thinking as they look up at the night sky. Do they look towards our sun? Do they wonder the same things we wonder? Do they ask the same questions that we ask? And uh, do they have people who are capable of giving amazing, wonderfully inspiring lectures? <clears throat> One of my very favorite lecture uh, quotes does not even come from a poet, comes from a politician. It comes from John F. Kennedy, who was talking to the uh, Congress in, I think it was May of 1961. And he said, I believe this nation should commit itself to landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth before the decade is out. And uh, a year later at Rice University, where I was, where I was visiting just about a few months ago, <coughs> He said, we choose to go to the moon. It's not that, he didn't say we have to go to the moon. He didn't say it would be fun if we went to the moon. He said, we choose to go to the moon. Not because it is easy, but because it is hard. So we do what is hard. It's not easy, it's not easy to do for us to do what is hard certainly wasn't easy for me to do what is hard. I wanted to become a professional astronomer until that night <clears throat> under the night sky seeing the Laird meteors. And I decided instead that I was going to get a master's degree in English poetry. I did my thesis. <clears throat> I did my thesis on uh, Hopkins, which turned out very well. I did my, and I, and I just kind of let it go after that point. As soon as I got my master's degree, I relocated to Tucson, Arizona, got myself a house in Corona de Tucson, which is about, about maybe 50, 60 kilometers southeast of Tucson. And I enjoyed that time immensely, and I got my career going. Discovered my first comet in 1984, my second one after Halley in 1987, found a second comet that same year, third one 
1988. Anyway, by the time the early 90s came along, between the comets I was finding visually with my own telescope and the comets that I was finding with my friends Gene and Carol and Shoemaker photographically, I think I had found about 20, 19 or 20 comets. And then came Shoemaker-Levy 9. Shoemaker-Levy 9 was not a comet that was famous for what it was. I did get a couple of visual looks at it. In fact, after the uh, comet was discovered, I got, I got home. It was like about four or five days later. Our observing run at Palomar was over. As soon as I got home, I set up my telescope, found Jupiter, <clears throat> and I was able to see this long stretch, this long stretch of, of thread that was really all that I could sit make out of Shoemaker-Levy 9. <laughs> Shoemaker-Levy 9 was not a famous comet for what it was. It was a famous comet for what it did. It was the first time in the history of humanity that we have been able to sit back and watch a cosmic impact, a comet colliding with a planet, two major objects in the solar system colliding with each other. It was incredible <clears throat> and wonderful. And uh, I think that would be, the, to talk about SL9 would be the subject of an entirely different presentation, which yeah. maybe I'll do yeah. some other time. <laughs> Scotty seems to be agreeing there. <laughs> but uh, but I remember that this was a subject not this was not as as a friend of mine said at the time, Shoemaker Levy Nine was not the astronomer's comet. It was the people's comet. It was everybody else's comet. It was a chance for, for the world to put aside the daily news broadcasts for a while, to put aside the excitement of the scandals and the forever never-ending stories that go on in the world, and to pause for a moment, look up at the planet Jupiter, and watch with the tiniest of telescopes to watch these very dark splotches on Jupiter. The comet itself might have been very difficult to see with a telescope. These blotches on Jupiter were visible with any telescope at all. <clears throat> in a way, the discovery and the uh, impacts of Shoemaker Levy 9 were really a culmination of my career. They reminded me of Senator Carl Schertz. He is a senator who lived at the start of the Civil War. And on April the 18th, 1859, he gave a lecture at Fannel Hall, which is a lecture hall still standing and still used in Boston. And he said these words, ideals are like stars. You will not succeed in touching them with your hands. But like the seafaring man on the desert of waters, you choose them as your guides and following them, you will reach your destiny. Now, I know there's some people who wouldn't like a quote like that. They're saying, oh, this is wrong. Wrong. Throw him out. <laughs> He's not going to amount to anything. This is astrological. You choose them as your guides, and following them, you will reach your destiny. <laughs> I don't think so. <clears throat> I started, I've been trying to figure out, actually in the time, the last few years, as I've been writing my latest book, which is, uh, my autobiography, A Night Watchman's Journey, uh, I've been trying to figure out exactly how I got into astronomy. Was it the meteor I saw at Twin Lake Camp in 1956? Was it my broken arm in 1960 and a cousin's gift of a gift, a get well present about the, about, about the uh, solar system? I don't think so. I think I got interested in astronomy because, as a youth, I had a tendency towards depression. Uh, at the time, they would last a long time. I would 
be moping around. <clears throat> they really got bad when I was a patient at the uh, at the Jewish National Home for Asthmatic Children. Uh, they stayed bad throughout my high school years and my time at Acadia, and culminated a year after I graduated from Acadia, when I, there was a major suicide attempt, when I very nearly took my own life. I don't remember anything that happened that day. I, I obviously, after I took the pills, I went in my mom's room and told her what I had done. And she didn't waste any time. She got my younger brother to take me to the hospital. I've never forgotten that, Jerry. And uh, they were able to save my life. <clears throat> the next morning when the doctors came in, they asked me how I was doing. And I told them I was doing all right. And I said, they were about to leave, and I said, was this a close call? And they looked at me and they said, oh, yes, it was. Another 30 minutes, and there wouldn't have been a damn thing we could have done for you. Would have been all over. 30 minutes more, and I would not have been associated with Shoemaker Levy 9, wouldn't have found any comets, wouldn't have written my book. I wouldn't be giving this lecture. And my friendship with so many of you in the audience and with Scotty would never have taken place. <clears throat> it is so very special to be able to I've come out of that because when I came out of that terrible time, I had a I had an epiphany of some sort where I really redoubled my efforts to go into astronomy, not because I wanted to become a professional astronomer, but because I wanted to discover the magic of the night sky. And then that eventually led to comets to Shoemaker Levy 9, and then it also went, <clears throat> led me to take a trip to Las Cruces, New Mexico. I was taking several trips there, writing the biography of Clyde Tombaugh, who is known as the discoverer of an asteroid, which is now known as Pluto. But for those of you who don't believe that, as I don't, I like to think of him as the discoverer of the planet Pluto. <clears throat> My mom wanted me to go start dating again. And she suggested that there was a lovely young woman who lived in Las Cruces. And she described her as a professor at New Mexico State University. It turned out that she was only she was but a high school teacher in Las Cruces. And her only contact with New Mexico State which is, was that she gave the uh, introduction to swimming course there. But that's good enough. <clears throat> and you know me, I just jumped right there and stopped what I was doing and I wrote to her and we got together just like that, 10 years later. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every few months mom would say, did you ever get in touch with Wendy? No. And after she'd asked me, and finally she said, oh, just forget the whole thing. That was the challenge. I wrote to her. I told her who I was. I told her that my mom had suggested that we might like to get together, and I would like to do that. And I got a lovely letter back from her describing her, her life, her lifestyle, her uh, teaching career which had gone on for over two decades, and her daughter, Nanette. And uh, that summer, in July of 1992, we finally got together. We had lunch, we went back, I met her sisters, and then went back to where I was staying, which was with Clyde and Patsy Tombaugh. We got to the house, Patsy opened the door, and she innocently said, well, how did your date go? I looked at Patsy and I said, Patsy, I have just had lunch with three of the most beautiful, intelligent women I have ever met in my life. What was I waiting for? Why did I put it off for so long? <laughs> <clears throat> we, we, uh, SL, this was before SL9. 
SL9 took place after that. And during the time of that comet, I decided not to be dating at all. Mm. But after that was over, I went back again, wrote to her again, and we got together. We had an actually lovely time. I actually gave, by this time we were getting quite a bit closer, I went to her high school, which was Sierra Vista Middle School. It was not a high school, it was a middle school. And I gave a talk. The talk went okay. It was the questions that I want to tell you about. <clears throat> the first question was, are you rich? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I am not rich, but I do have a brother named Richard. <laughs> oh, okay. The second question was the best one. Are you married? And before I had a chance to answer, one of the other teachers said, no, but we're working on it. <laughs> And uh, this is this is what happened. Um, in 1996, we went to visit. We went to visit Paris. We saw certain of the uh, major, the, certain of the major uh, buildings in Paris. We saw Notre Dame Cathedral, and as we were looking at Notre Dame Cathedral, I was thinking of a. Uh, television program I'd seen is now 50 years ago <clears throat> with Kenneth Clark. It's called the Civilization Series. And I want to call your attention to the opening scene of that series because they're showing Kenneth Clark, the camera's focused on him. The background shows Notre Dame Cathedral. And he says, what is civilization? I do not know. I cannot define it in abstract terms yet but I think I can recognize it when I see it. And I, and I, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Bless you. It's a good way, it's a good thing that we can't get coronavirus over the internet. <coughs> anyway, don't worry, I do not have that. I just have a little bit of asthma. Scotty would know all about that. Yes, yes, he yes, would. Yes. <coughs> But I think I can recognize civilization when I see it. And then the camera goes to the cathedral and, sa and he says, and I am looking at it right now. And this is it. Can I define astronomy? No. Astronomy, of course, is the study of the stars, study of the universe, the study of space and time. But that's the dictionary definition. What astronomy really is, is my life. It's my passion. It's something that I love to do more than anything else. It's something that led me back to English literature. One day, shortly after Wendy and I were married, I was sitting in, in my room doing some uh, research, and suddenly I said, Wendy, maybe I should finish what I started go back to school and get my doctorate. And Wendy stopped what she was doing and she said, oh boy, we need to talk about this. And I said, oh no, we don't have to because this is a thought that comes up every, every five years. The talk comes up, the idea that I should get a doctorate comes up, I squash it into the sand outside, hurry <laughs> it, and I don't have to worry about it for another five years. So I said, Wendy, don't worry about it. <clears throat> what Wendy did next changed my life. She said, David, before we bury it this time, let's you and I talk about it. We talked about it. I, we had already visited Israel, and I wanted to uh, <clears throat> think about getting, getting the doctorate at the Hebrew University. I found a person there I could work with. I wanted to do it on Shakespeare. Because of all the writers that I had known, Shakespeare, who wrote about the eclipses of the sun and moon in King Lear, was someone who I thought was passionate about the night sky. I often thought that if Shakespeare were to come back now, and if he were to be sitting in Scotty's audience, he would not want to hear about Hamlet. He would not want to hear about Lear or the Merchant of Venice or Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare would want to hear about telescopes about about how to take a telescope and to find something in the sky. 
how to use a CCD and photograph Comet Neowise. That's what he would come back to do now, not to talk about the plays that he wrote 400 years ago. But it is those plays that Shakespeare and his colleagues wrote so long ago mm. that I mm. wanted to study. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I wanted to study plays that uh, his colleagues wrote. For example, John Fletcher, The Woman Hater in 1605, the year of the eclipse. Is it so much, and yet the more not up? See yonder where the shamefaced maiden comes into our sight. How gently doth she slide, hiding her chaste cheeks like a modest bride with a red veil of blushes. This was, uh, this is from The Woman Hater. <clears throat> not a very appropriate name today, but it was a fine play written over 400 years ago. We have had <clears throat> we have had a lot of fun together, taking a look at the uh, at the words and at plays and other things that uh, that we have seen. <clears throat> and we have a, we've had a chance to sort of take a look at some people who have also enjoyed the night sky. Hopkins, of course, was one of the best. He even thought he discovered a comet one day. He wrote to a friend of his. It turned out that it was the Beehive Star Cluster. Well, those of us who are know-it-alls in astronomy would say, how could you confuse the Beehive Star Cluster for a comet? Well, the famous astronomer Tom Garrels did. He said, I was looking out at the sky and I thought, is that a comet? Did Halley's Comet become so much brighter all of a sudden? No, that was the Beehive Cluster. Tom Garrels himself made that mistake. And it turns out there are a lot of people who do. I ended up writing a thesis about this. It was published. It was republished uh, in a second edition my doctorate and my master's thesis, and also an undergraduate essay I wrote about Tennyson, published in a book that I called The Starlight Night. That book is still available, and uh, it talks about it talks about the night sky as seen by people who wrote English literature. <clears throat> we get to the end, a chance to, for me to entertain some of your questions and uh, a chance to to take a look at the final piece of writing. The piece that I'm choosing right now is by Sevilla Martin, and it has absolutely nothing to do about astronomy. She wrote it in 1905. It's called His Eye is on the Sparrow. It's a religious piece of writing, and uh, I choose not to quote it right now. But I couldn't get my mind off these words. And so I decided to take the words, put them down, and change them to something that I thought had the same meaning as what Martin wanted to write. But instead, <clears throat> but instead has a more direct affiliation with me and my passion. It's called My Eye is on the Sky. And it goes back to the days when I had my depression. And incidentally, I still am subject to depression. But instead of these depressions lasting for weeks and months, as if you can ask Wendy, she'll tell you, they now ask for, they now last for minutes or hours at the most. And they usually end when I read this. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies. I draw closer to the sky. I draw closer to the sky. From care it sets me free. My eye is on the sky, and I know it watches me. My eye is on the sky, and I know it watches me. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, David. So I, there are some questions, um, uh, and I want to thank everybody who watched. On uh, we were simulcast today on Facebook and YouTube, and 
uh, <coughs> and, uh, and Twitter. And so it was great to have you all on today. Um, there are some comments that I'll uh, let you know about, David, um, uh, and a question. Uh, Dean, Dean Bostador uh, Sr. just wanted to know, he said, tonight's movie night with wifey, will this be available later for replay? Yes, they are. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so if you get a chance, you'll want to watch it later. Um, uh, there's a comment from a guy on, on Twitter. He's given me his name, but I won't say it here on the air. But his, uh, his uh, I'm sorry, Twitch, his, uh, his handle is Redbeard. And he says, love your Comet Hunter scope, David. And Scott, it's my workhorse. So that's great. Uh, Bergman Scooter uh, says, I'm a big fan. Um, Imbante from Cameroon. He's uh, the International Astronomical Union's uh, outreach coordinator uh, in Cameroon, Africa, and he says he says hello. Um, Carlos Fernandez, who, you, who who you've met, says uh, uh, hello, David and Scott. Great to spend an afternoon with you and David talking about shooting stars and poetry. Best wishes to you and Wendy. Cesar Brolo is watching from Argentina. Uh, he says it's a pleasure to listen to Dr. David Levy. Um, Nico Rocha uh, from Facebook, he says, I love this, art and science together. Um, let's see, Mbante from Cameroon, he liked your shot of your comment there. So it is a nice image there. Lance Shaw, haven't seen you since the Starry Nights Festival in Joshua Tree in 1997. Uh, there were four double A VSOers all in one place. You, Bob, Gent, and Gene Hansen, and me. Yeah, we we missed Bob Gent. He was a great astronomer. Yes. Yeah. That's the piece, Bob. Yep. Ron Delvaux says IT survived. Uh, oh, it survived, though swing around the sun. Something Comet Atlas was unable to do in one piece. Sometimes comets do they get destroyed as they go around the sun. Um, Ron Delvaux says, I experienced Comet Levy Shoemaker 9 with my 10-inch reflector. <clears throat> yeah, that was something that, man, I don't know how many people were watching, but uh, it must have been millions of amateur and professional astronomers. Everybody had their scope turned on that. Um, very exciting times. This is a very important question, David. Uh, Nico Rocchia wants to know, what do you feel when you discover, when you discovered your first comet? What did you feel? It's magic. I I treat my comets as my own children, and uh, whenever I go out under the night sky, whether I'm in a good mood or not a good mood, it always makes me feel better. <clears throat> But when I see a comet, as I did the other morning, you know, when I first went out to see a Neowise, and I was having trouble spotting it, and the sky was getting darker, lighter, and I was going to miss it, and I just went to a slightly farther, higher spot, took my binoculars, looked sighted on Capella, and went down, and suddenly, bang, there it was. Yeah. It was like an old friend talking to me. Hello, David. I'm Comet Neowise. Good to meet you. And I said, hello, Comet Neowise. It's great to meet you. But uh, the other answer to your question is that <clears throat> I feel when I discover, at the moment I discover a comet, I am as close to being in space on a trip to Mars or on a trip to the moon as I ever really need to be. Because finding a new comet, a new child of mine in a way, is like no other feeling. It's magic. And it adds to the passion that I feel about the night sky. Yeah. It's a magical feeling. Yeah. Good well, question. Good question. Um, Red Beard says, all I can say is two of my favorite astronomy people on the same screen is awesome. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's great. It's awesome to have yeah, you. I'm glad, I'm glad that he yeah. said that, Scotty. Yeah. And he's right. Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> Certainly about you. Yep. Yeah, uh, especially you. Um, uh, Carlos, well, Hernandez. One other time. <laughs> Carlos <clears throat> Hernandez says, great memories from the discovery of Shoemaker Levy 9. I remember this great event when astronomers around the world worked together to record and witness this unique event in the history of mankind. David, I, I want to ask you something. Um, uh, you know, because of this pandemic, I've heard this more than once now, <clears throat> but people have, uh, in fact, I was on with uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is John Crisp, great astrophotographer. Um, he he has told me that he thinks that the people involved in astronomy are getting a kind of psychotherapy or even uh, a um, a spiritual benefit <clears throat> from being out under the night sky and reconnecting with the stars. And uh, he said also that the 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 the, the sharing of information that we're doing on uh, programs like this live one here, he says uh, it has to be helping so many people. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about that? This is one of the real untold advantages of the coronavirus pandemic. We are having what you're offering over Facebook. <clears throat> many of the astronomy clubs are doing meetings on either Zoom or WebEx. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been able to attend more Montreal Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada meetings since the coronavirus started than I ever did before that when they just met in person. And I kind of hope that, <coughs> excuse me, I hope that once the um, pandemic is over, they'll still allow us to meet over Zoom or WebEx. Yes. So we'll be able to continue meeting this way. I'm enjoying these meetings absolutely thoroughly and i often try to log in <clears throat> to your facebook sessions oh i see you many so thank you thanks for doing that uh gary palmer uh from the uk sends his salutations um lance shaw he says as an aside what was the last variable you estimated nice explanation he also <clears throat> had a nice explanation of how to estimate the brightness of neowise the last variable star I estimated was Clyde star, TV Corvi, 12, 15 minus 18, I think it is. Mm -hmm. It is a star that I came across while studying Clyde Tombaugh's work at Lowell Observatory. I found out that he had discovered this nova in Corvus. When I did some more work that included looking at every possible Harvard College Observatory photographic plate I could find of this star, I found there were, I found many, many plates of the Corvus region, of which nine of them showed the star in outburst. Hmm. <clears throat> and I went right over to Brian Marsden's office, may he rest in peace now, yep. and I told him, showed him the data, and he said, this is great, what do you want me to do about it? I said, well, announce it, it's a new cataclysmic variable. And he said, I'm not going to announce it. And I said, why not? And he looked at me. Yeah, why not? <laughs> an amateur astronomer. And uh, I said, Brian Mims fighting words. And he laughed and laughed. He laughed. And he said, if you were a professional who would observe one night a year at Kid Peak, I wouldn't expect you to do this. But because you're an amateur and you have a beautiful telescope at home, I'm going to give you an assignment. You're going to look at the field visually every night. It's gone up so many times, it'll go up again. And when it does, then I will announce it as a current item. And that's exactly what Brian did. Oh, that's great. And that's the last estimate I've made a couple of nights ago. Last two nights have been cloudy. But tonight, might we might get a break, and I might go out and get it again. That's my favorite variable star discovered by one of my very favorite people. Yes. You know, David, you have met, I mean, some of the truly iconic, I mean, you are one of the iconic people in our 
in our community, but um, <clears throat> you know, you knew Bart Bach, you knew Clyde Tomba. I mean, not not just <clears throat> met them. They weren't just acquaintances. These are people that you really got to personally know uh, deeply, and um, uh, you know, and many others. What have you learned from these people? I mean, and and your whole experience in astronomy. I mean, you've been in, you've been neck deep in discoveries. You have you you've had an astronomy experience that few people have. Uh, wh what do you walk away with? What's what's I think the best I think the best way I can answer that is through analogy. One of the people that I've gotten acquainted with over the years was Arthur C. Clarke, and that was very unexpected. Yeah. I just bought a uh, program that allows you to talk into a microphone and uh, then it will type the words on uh, the screen. Okay. Getting most of them wrong. <clears throat> but it wanted me to train. And the way it wanted me to train was that it gave me Clark's book 3001. And I didn't know that 3001 had come out yet. Mm -hmm. And I started reading it. And of course, when it got to the end, I immediately ordered the book from uh, Amazon and finished it. And I wrote, and I turned out that I had his email address. I wouldn't dare write to him, but I did. Hmm. And I wrote to him, told him the story of the uh, program and that they had used this book and that how much I enjoyed it. He wrote back. And we wrote back forth again and again about every uh, topic. Our, our back and forth emails lasted the last 10 years of his life. Lasted the last 10 years of his life. And then one day, one night I was watching 2010, and I was enthralled with the scene of Jupiter near the end of the movie when the spot appears. And I looked at the spot and it looked exactly like... <clears throat> <clears throat> like one of the SL9 spots, excuse me. So I wrote to Arthur, and I told him, by then we were on a first-name basis, and I told him about this, and he immediately wrote back, he said, David, I'm going to watch 2010 tonight just to see that scene again, because <laughs> I love the scene as much as you do. Hmm. The brief answer to your question is that I learn that these people, as famous as they are, and as wonderful as they are, are people. They have their own fears, their own upsets, their own moods. And by getting to write about, write to them, or talk to them, or visit with them, I get to see them not as famous astronomers, famous writers, famous poets, but people. Yeah. One of the people that I met was Jonathan Tennyson. He turned out that he's an astronomer. He has a very famous great-great-grandfather. Mm, yes. And uh, I asked him uh, if the family uh, tradition helps or hurts him. And he says, in big capital letters, hurts. Our family tradition goes back a long way. And it's a very difficult one. And I try to avoid poetry wherever I can. Whenever possible. <laughs> I try not to think about it. Well, it turned out I was in London just a few weeks later, and I met the man. First thing I see in his office is a framed copy of two stanzas from a memoriam. <clears throat> and I looked at the frame, I looked at the stanzas, and I looked at him, and I said, really a negative influence? And he said, well, I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he, was a, he is a wonderful, wonderful scientist. Yes. Not only that, but he did research in Shoemaker Levy 9. Awesome. So there was really a direct connection there. That's awesome. <clears throat> I remember watching you on, uh, on national television, you know, sitting there with uh, uh, Gene Shoemaker and Carolyn Shoemaker, and um, we were all waiting with uh, bated breath to see if we could see anything, any effect at all, because we knew that the pieces were about to hit Jupiter. and um, uh, it was, uh, I mean, it was really spectacular. Um, I was set up at Mount Wilson during that time, and I had, I had two telescopes there because I wanted to see. I had a toy 
50 millimeter telescope from, made by Tasco, and I had a Mead 16 inch telescope set up there. Okay, and I was going back and forth between these two telescopes, and uh, an older gentleman came and looked at the eyepiece. He says, "I see the impact," and, and, and it was still daytime. Okay, and I said, "No, that's that's got probably ah, that couldn't be an impact. <laughs> that must be a shadow of one of the moons." And of course, I was wrong. I was wrong. Uh, he, that gentleman probably very much was uh, one of the first people to visually see one of the impacts on Jupiter. So I was, uh, that <clears throat> taught me a lesson uh, to uh, any observation that's made to pay it the uh, respect that it might deserve, okay? Um, you know, and not to just immediately uh, toss out uh, an observation like that and, and you know, pigeonhole this thing and saying, no, it's this, okay? I wonder how many mistakes have been made in discovery by people uh, who, in fact, saw something for the very first time, but uh, were uh, uh, just said, "No, nah, couldn't be, couldn't be that. It's got to be this." So, one of the people that I met, Scotty, and that I did know was Carl Sagan. Oh wow! And uh, I got yeah. to know him really well at the Shoemaker Levy Nine Impact. Yeah. Uh, period. <clears throat> he was very brusque with me he didn't really want to talk with me hmm. he uh, when I I made the I made a very innocent comment that I thought that Vice President Gore's speech about the comet was really pretty good hmm. he said David how could you possibly say such a thing the guy knows absolutely not the first thing about science the first thing about comets or the first thing about planets how can you say such a thing and I said well I'm sorry he said don't be sorry just answer my question <clears throat> he was that way. This really happened. He, yeah. Wow. But he loved my mom. <clears throat> my mother was there. Okay. And he found out that mom was around uh, in the early 1950s when Watson and Crick had discovered the structure of DNA. And that was one of Carl's major interests. And when he found out that mom was around at that time and was a part of that, he was just entranced with my mom. <clears throat> and at the end of it, mom and I are talking and I'm saying, boy, Carl was really, really rude to me. And mom said, yes, but he's really very smart and very handsome. <laughs> and very handsome, by the way. <laughs> yeah, very handsome. <laughs> oh, I love That's that. a great story. I didn't, I didn't mind at all after that, <laughs> that Carl really enjoyed my mom so much. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I miss her a lot, but those are, those are among the best memories. Yeah, that's great. Uh, another comment here. I have a David Levy comment hunter. Uh, I think maybe I, I've already mentioned this, uh, but he wanted to say that, uh, uh, that he loved the scope and he, he loves hearing what you have to say. Uh, Ansel Puri uh, in Los Angeles, enlightening to hear David talk about astronomy and its lessons regarding the human condition. Your humility and great sense of humor shines brighter and has a longer tail than SL9. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. I appreciate that. Actually, SL9 had not one tail, but like 21 tails. 21 and tails. Very, very short. Yeah. They didn't go very long. The really interesting thing was that bar of dust that joined all of the heads together. Yeah, yeah I remember the, really the, the, the first image of it, uh, it did look like something like a stealth fighter or something. I think that a lot of people were saying <clears throat> so. Um, someone wants to know, what is your favorite optical tube assembly, your favorite telescope? Right now, my favorite tube assembly has got to be Eureka, which is the telescope I'm going to ask you to describe it a bit, because you can describe it better than I did. You built it. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> two things that uh, it's a 12 inch F5. Yeah. And uh, it is wonderful. And uh, the star images are absolutely precise. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. Hmm. And on top of everything, I just got Dean Koenig from Star Arizona to put encoders on it. Right. And. Uh, so it's even better now. And now you it sent me a picture of that. I'm going to show this right now. So here's the setup. And you can see 
you can see the base of the telescope here. Um, uh, this is the, 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 this is one of our uh, trust tube Dobsonians. Uh, David's named it Eureka. And um, you can see the encoders on the uh, altitude axis and the one that you can't see is on the azimuth axis down below. And uh, the display is up here on top uh, attached to his trust tubes. And, uh, and this allows you to uh, have digital setting circles. Does, does, this, um, does this system have a, um, um, does it have a built-in library so you can punch in like an NGC <coughs> number and it would find it? Or is it set, just NGC, setting circles? The NGC Max does have a big library. Okay. And in fact, in testing it, I, um, I sighted out on two, two stars, turned out was Mizar and Alakturis. And then I said, I want to find uh, M3. So in the catalog, I wrote down M3, told me how many, how far to move it in altitude, how far down in azimuth, and there was M3. So it does have that. Also, there's a thing called identify. So if I find M3, and I ask it to identify it, it'll tell me it's M3. And uh, it's just a wonderful thing. Two of the most decent people that I've ever met in astronomy or anywhere else. Scotty Roberts is definitely one of them. Oh, thanks, man. Dean, Dean Koenig at Star Arizona oh, yeah. is another. Dean, Dean has uh, done so much uh, for the community. Uh, and he's also uh, got, he's a great engineer. Uh, he is uh, just this multi-talented uh, uh, <clears throat> telescope builder, amateur astronomer, um, you know, and for someone to be in the business like that, it's fantastic, you know. So he's given benefit to a lot of people uh, in that regard. Um, and uh, he, has, he has his own line of uh, telescope accessories and stuff like that. So I would definitely, you know, if you're looking for something unique and looking to up your game a little bit uh, in, in ways to tweak your telescope, check out Star Arizona. You know, that's, that's definitely a place to go. So I think it's, this website is star, starzona.com, so. Yes, it is, and it's, yeah. it's beautiful. And uh, one of the things he sells is the Explore Scientific line of telescopes. He, he does. sells. Yes, he does. I think he has a David Levy Comet Hunter there in in stock in the store i saw oh, one last wow. time wow there. it's one of the few places to get one right now so <laughs> yeah so they, and, they've uh, become rare and um uh people ask me all the time about the david levy comet hunter and that's an interesting story in itself because you and i had talked about collaborating and developing a, a david levy scope and when i finally got my own company and i said okay david we're going to do it now this is one of our first projects we're going to work on to together. You gave me this long list of things that it had to do, you know, that it had to be good for, of course, searching for comets. It had to have enough aperture for that. It had to show great views of deep sky objects. But you said it had to also be really good for planetary. And you said, and it's also got to be a great astrograph. And so, gosh, you know, normally you have a telescope that either does this really well or that really well or this really well but you kind of said you set a pretty high bar <laughs> and so we decided on a maxitov newtonian design and uh you know the rest is history so uh, scotty would you recommend that i use the tube assembly of the david levy comet hunter as a baseball bat could be could be <laughs> but you, you'll want to use a very soft ball you know so. <laughs> very soft ball <laughs> Because you Sorry know. about that. I love the telescope. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But right, so. right now, my favorite one is Eureka. And I can tell you about the name. Now, you Eureka. name all of your telescopes. This is something yes. if you don't know, David Levy. Uh, you know, it may come to a surprise to you that somebody would name so many telescopes. And he's named them all. And you have owned many, many telescopes. So... And they all have names, but Eureka has a special story to it because, because um, one of the, the asteroids that I discovered, not Jean and Carolyn, not Henry Holt, but me, 
I put the, I loaded the film, set it up, took the picture, scanned the film and discovered the asteroid. It is the first Martian Trojan asteroid. It is on the L5, the Grangian five point in the orbit of Mars, about a third of the way past it in the orbit. It's been that way for millions upon millions of years. It is a genuine Martian Trojan. Oh, wow. And we named it, we decided to name it Eureka as an expression of joy on making a discovery in honor of Archimedes, who was taking a bath when he discovered his, um, you know, as he put, he put something in the bathtub and the water, it displaced the water in the bathtub. Right. And he figured it out. And he was so excited about it that he jumped out of the bathtub, ran down the street yelling, Eureka, Eureka. <laughs> now, there is no naked, evidence right? in the story. He was naked. <laughs> no evidence in the oh. story I read that he had bothered to put some clothes on before doing that or dry himself off. I see. Anyway, so we named it that. I don't know. <laughs> and then when uh, when I got this telescope from you, I thought it had to be named Eureka. Uh, that's that's and really cool. That's in case cool. any of you wish to write to me, and it might be dangerous, so I'm going to ask you, don't give the email to people that you don't trust, but the email is Eureka. And I got Eureka right around the time I decided to donate my very first telescope to the Linda Hall Library of Science. Yeah. And anybody who has never visited the Linda Hall Library, put it on your to-do list. You have to visit it, Linda Hall Library. So I donated Echo, Echo, which was the name of my very first telescope over 60 years ago to the Linda Hall Library. So therefore, the email address is Eureka dot one word instead of echo at iCloud.com. Eureka dot instead wow. of echo. I think you're going to get about a bazillion email <laughs> dot com. That's my email address. <clears throat> wow. So if you want to write to David and ask him some questions, there you go. There you go. Okay. So uh, we have more comments here, David. Um, uh, <clears throat> Satish uh, Puri, who is listening from India, says you have a very interesting India. life story. Yeah. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Somebody wants to know, Ron Delvo wants to know what the green telescope is behind you. There it is. This is Alouette. Alouette. Okay. And Alouette is a finder telescope that I bought years and years ago oh, when I was at Acadia and I wanted to get a, uh, an, a real finder telescope. Not one of these toy ones that you look through and, and you, you step on it, but a real <laughs> you step on on it. <laughs> finder telescope. You can use it as a baseball bat. But you can use it. And, uh, yes. yeah. and it'll survive. Yeah, it looks this like it's built very well. There are actually three Alouette telescopes. The first one is missing. I don't know where it is. Hmm. This is the second one. And there's a third one that's out in the observatory. That's right. This is Alouette. Very good. Very good. Um, I didn't even see back there. <laughs> let's see. Carlos <clears throat> Hernandez says, thank you, David and Scott, for an entertaining and wonderful talk. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, Carlos has been one, one of our shows, too. He gave a very nice uh, uh, lecture. It was great. Uh, Dusty Haskins says, David, I have to say, if someone's life is a story, would it be worth reading? Uh, is a story, would it be worth reading? I'd have to say yours is a New York Times bestseller epic novel. So, whoa, whoa. thank you for the compliment. I nice. really do appreciate that. I wish more people would buy my autobiography. <laughs> yeah. It seems, it seems that its publication has, has been a well kept secret. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Uh, you Where can, can they buy this me. book? Where can they buy it now? They can actually buy it from me directly if they want, because uh, through, uh, what do they call it? What do they call that PayPal. program again? PayPal. PayPal. Okay. They can now buy it from me. 
It sells for $34.95 American. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, if you buy it from me, then you get it autographed. Ah, that's... You can also get it, if you're in Canada, uh-huh. I would recommend you get it from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada okay. online bookstore. And it's, again, $34.95. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the United States, it's not on Amazon yet. But uh, and we're trying to work out something that there, there will be a distributor someday. Okay. And I hope more people will buy it before my next book comes out. Can I tell them about my next book? Yeah, talk about the next book. <clears throat> of all the books I've written, Wendy's favorite. Stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I think Wendy is on the floor right now. <laughs> Wendy's favorite book is a book called Clipper. Clipper. Clipper is 81 pages long, nine chapters, nine pages each. Wow. And it's about my first dog. I wrote it when I was 10 years old. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I still have the original. In fact, here's the original. You have the original manuscript. It's right here. And, oh, my uh, God. It's wow. right here. Anyway. Very cool. Wendy has talked me into doing a rewrite of Clipper. And I'm in the middle of that right now. It's Clipper is a, uh, <clears throat> a magic dog, a mm -hmm. magic beetle, who takes Stephen, Tanya, uh, Kaya, the, the, his little group, on a magical tour of the cosmos, seeing the planets. We're actually out and uh, looking through Bada's window at the Milky Way right now, and off to some of the nearby galaxies. And that is the book I'm working on That's right cool. now. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> when do you think it'll be out? Uh, when do you think it'll be published? I don't know. We may end up publishing, self-publishing it, um, but I don't know. Many people do. Um, before it is published, it has to be finished, and it is not finished yet. Oh. Yeah. But you started it when you were 10. I started it when I was 10. This has been a long time. And gave project. up on it to live my life. <laughs> And now that I'm getting older yes. and forgetful and uh, not really remembering this telescope so much, I'm going back to Clipper to write about Clipper. And I'm framing it now, not so much as the book I wrote when I was 10, but as this magical trip through the cosmos oh, by a magic telescope. And guess what the name of the magic telescope is? Mm. Clipper? Eureka! <laughs> Eureka! <laughs> yeah. Eureka is the spaceship that oh, takes, that's awesome. that that takes awesome. the uh, takes the group on their uh, trip through space. That is awesome. Um, okay, so Eric Briggs uh, says Comet Neowise is a good start. We have seen it two mornings so far this week, starting with the Mead 60 millimeter comet seeker that I was given for my 10th birthday in 1987. Thank you both. Very nice. Well, thank you. I really uh, appreciate you being there. Yeah. I have not yet seen Neowise with a telescope yet. So I guess I'm really behind the times. Here. Yeah, you need to get you need to get on the telescope. Yeah, you need to get on. Yeah. Um, you know, first and start doing this. <laughs> uh, Redbeard says, I hope to meet Neowise soon if I can get some clear skies in the morning. Yes, let's all pray for clear skies. Gary Palmer says... <laughs> <laughs> there is something magical about seeing comets with your own eyes. I would agree with that. Now, Gary is a fantastic astrophotographer, but uh, the visual experience of seeing a comet is, uh, it's very personal, you know, so, and everybody has a different reaction to it. Similar to, I think, uh, when people see an, a total eclipse, you know, if they see a beautiful, bright comet, it's just something totally unexpected for them. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really like the idea that comets are magical. And it's not so much that they're just there. It's they're talking to you. They're moving. They won't be in the same spot tomorrow. No. Be a little bit different. Uh, uh, Neil Wise has just learned that most people don't like the morning sky. 
So it's now working its way into the evening sky. It'll be an evening comet within a week or so. Yes. And it'll, as it moves north. Its orbit is like 6,700 years or something like that. So yeah. this thing has been coming for thousands of years. Okay. It'll come back again. But <laughs> this is your chance to go out and see it. Okay. This is your this is a, Yeah. And this it's is a beautiful a, show. A beautiful show. I'm reluctant to call it yet the Great Comet of 2020, but it's it's kind of knocking on the door there. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. Ed Gunther's uh, watching and uh, Low Ed. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he says I finally had an analog experience with a friend. Uh, this is plus three M, imaging Neowise this morning over late. Uh, Champlain. I've loved the online experiences, but an in-person was therapeutic for us. Yes. I'll bet it was. Yep. And Ed, please give our love to Wendy, to your Wendy. And uh, we hope to see you both in person pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, Redbeard <clears throat> uh, says this is the best content he's ever seen on Twitch. So thank you. That's saying a lot. <laughs> Thanks. It's saying a lot. Yeah, there are millions of people on Twitch. So thank you very much. Um, Ed Gunther says, uh, David and Wendy taught me that. Big smile. Uh, David <laughs> Martinez says, hi, David. Sal Saludos desde Argentina. Okay. Yep. Ron Delvo wants to know if you've ever seen a two-headed meteor. A two-headed meteor, yes. Um, in fact, I saw one in, on August the 12th, 1962. I was observing the Perseids from my grandfather's cottage at Jarnak, the original Jarnak. And I saw a meteor that appeared to have two heads and uh, two streaks that went right together. And I think it was just two specks of dust that happened to be either gravitationally bound or just coincidentally close to each other. They both entered the Earth's atmosphere at the same time. Mm. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, you've been all over the world. One, and, and not only are you so well known about comets, but you've gone to a number of eclipses, too. And uh, um, I know that you went to Antarctica one time to go see an eclipse. 2003, yeah. Yeah. And that was, it, was, uh, it wasn't an eclipse that went around near the horizon and uh... yeah in fact we did not see the entire eclipse because at totality the bottom of the sun was actually below the horizon yeah but boy that was something else the the key to that eclipse was we had a 12 minute shadow bends wow <laughs> that's fantastic hold on a second wendy wants me to say something She wants me to tell you what time of day the eclipse was. Hmm. I'm going to do that because I want to stay married to Wendy. <laughs> I really want to This is the deal breaker right here. If you don't do yeah, this, this is a it's deal over. Breaker. It's over. <laughs> um, now, what did you want me to say again? Oh, yeah. The time of the eclipse. Yeah. You ready for the answer? Drum roll. Midnight. The midnight, midnight sun. Oh. Midnight. Wow. wow that's cool. That's cool. Wow. Well, I, I, thinking about meteors reminds me of uh, that they have found so many meteors in the ice of Antarctica. You know, if they find some stone in, in, uh, in the ice, it's, it's most likely a meteor. So um, it's uh, a good friend of ours, um, uh, both of ours, Mike Reynolds, who's passed on, uh, discovered a, uh, a Martian meteorite in the ice there. So that was very exciting. Um, for that. Well, that's um, what started the Martian meteorite thing was finding them on Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And uh, 84001, that lovely specimen, that really got going with the uh, idea that there might be some uh, microbial life on Mars. And that has never been ruled out all these years later. Yeah. We're still looking for it. That's right. Yeah. And we got the Mars 2020 rover. Uh, they per they pulled up. Uh, JPL sent me a.
video of them, uh, time lapse of them assembling uh, the um, the Mars 2020 uh, cone, so that they can put it up on top of the rocket, and it's going to be they're going to launch it here pretty soon. So that's so cool, so cool. Well, I'm looking forward to that. If they launch it early, late enough in the day, we'll watch it. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be asleep. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, we'll be asleep. I would like to go into space someday. Yes. In fact, I'm going to give you the Clark Chapman answer. If NASA builds a shuttle launch facility in our backyard, okay, they build the rocket and the uh, shuttle and everything right there. Mm -hmm. And if they promise me that I can be launched into space and return to Earth before dinner, before dinner, <laughs> before dinner, or after dinner and before snacks, late bedtime snacks, I might go. You might go. <laughs> I might go. But when I'm at my telescope, when I'm with my telescope, yeah. I'm looking through the eyepiece, and I'm uh, looking at the night sky, I'm as close to space as I ever need to be. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we are flying through space. We're, you know, I remind people, uh, especially kids, when we're, uh, uh, you know, able to share the eyepiece together and I remind them that they are on this amazing spaceship, you know, called Earth. And we are. We're flying through space all the time. We're in a new part of space we've never been to all the time, yeah. you know. So it's a, you know, it's a great adventure, you know, and, and the the advantage that we have to have eyes and and uh, the kind of mind that can wonder and explore is, is really, I mean, it's fantastic. Um, Carlos Hernandez says, I was also very fortunate to have met the great Dr. Carl Sagan in December of 1995 for the Galileo probe entry into the atmosphere of Jupiter at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. He discussed the possibility of amino acids over the rings of Uranus at lunchtime to a group of JPL astronomers and myself, a great person and scientist. Yeah, he was. Carlos, thanks so much for saying that, because yeah. I've told you stories about Carl. And despite the fact that Carl was, um, but Carl was that way to everybody. But uh, despite his his um, roughness with me, I love the man and I miss him. And uh, he was an excellent writer. He uh, Cosmos, the personal voyage, was absolutely breathtaking it was one of the best tv show programs i've ever seen in my life yeah i really was something i'll tell you yes um ron delvo said that uh, dean uh this is uh, dean of starzona did work on my scope and he's a great guy claude yes, primate uh, from the big bear solar observatory he's he's the, Hello, uh, the astronomer there he says, are comets completely random, or is there some sort of comet season? I like to think, that's a good question, Claude. I like to think that there is a comet season. Hmm. But you could have, like it's been since 2007, since we've had a really good comet. That's uh, 2007, that's 13 years. And we might have another good comet this summer. Hmm. We might have two more good comets this summer. Or we may not have another one for another 40 years. So I would say essentially random. Not just their orbits, but their behavior. Because even if they come in, they could actually decide at the last minute to fall to pieces. Mm. And not. <clears throat> There's an astronomer who said, and you guys have to guess who said it, comets are like cats. <clears throat> they both have tails, and they both do precisely what they want. <laughs> I'm going to guess it was you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thanks. That's right. Um, Redbeard on Twitch wants to know, what did you name your Comet Hunter telescope? Well, the current one is Eureka. This one here, which you can actually see, this one here is Minerva, and I've had this since 1967 in one form or another. Uh, the Explore Scientific one mm -hmm. is called Narcissus. Narcissus, oh, okay. Yes. 
And uh, the one that I've discovered all my visual comments with is called Miranda from uh, the Shakespeare's The Tempest. And I did discover a comet with one of my first telescopes, hmm. an eight-inch Newtonian from Cave Optical. Oh, wow. Named Texas. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So those are the telescopes that I've used for searching for comets. Mm -hmm. Armando Lee, uh, he's watching from the Philippines, and he says, Hi, David. Nice to see you online. Hi. Yep. Good. good I'm glad you're here, too. Yeah. <clears throat> Ansel Puri says, when you have discovered comets, did you set out to discover them in a certain portion of the sky or were they passing by, were you just passing by at the right place at the right time? No, I, that's a good question. I started, this is actually the topic of a different lecture, but I started searching for comets on uh, December the 17th, 1965. I was walking that fall on my way to my French oral examinations, and I thought, they're going to ask me, what do you want to do as a career? And I better come up with something. Mm. And I knew about a Kiyosaki, the Great Comet of 1965, that was on its way in at the time. And I thought, suddenly, je veux découvrir une comet. I'm going to discover a comet. So I got to school. I'm all excited. And Mr. Hutchison says, asked me what I want to do as a career, and I was so proud of myself, and I sat there and I said, Monsieur Hutchison, je veux découvrir une comète. Mr. Hutchison looks at me, takes off his glasses, he says, how the hell do you expect to make any money? How you doing? Like that? <laughs> <laughs> at which point everybody in the room just cracked up. Mm. <clears throat> and he said, okay, okay, I'm going to give you credit for your answer because it's original, I have to give you that. Yes. If you don't discover a comet within 20 years, I'm gonna come back and lower your mark. I'm gonna give you an F. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> I wish that I could have written to him when I found my first comet yeah. 19 years later. Oh, that's <laughs> so awesome, I'm 19 years later, wow. 19 years later, wow. leave you. Um, Tracy Prell, uh, uh, says, wow, oh, David H. Levy, highly recommend the Linda Hall Library. I know Ben Cross, Vice President for Research and Scholarship at the Linda Hall <laughs> Library, and she says she would love to read that book, Clipper. <laughs> well, you might, you might be able to at some point. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, Wendy says that the uh, original is better than the one that I'm working on now. But you have to remember, I was only 10 years old when I wrote the original. And he says that's why it's so good. It's not good. <laughs> it's from the heart. That's right. Peter Singh. I ran out of things to say at the end of it. You ran out of things to say? <laughs> yeah, but in the original book. You've written 40 books, David. How could you run out of things to okay. say? Scotty, Scotty, can you hear me right now? Yes. I am the virtual person. I have no body, just a You're voice. The, like that voice behind the door or something. <laughs> that's yes. right. That's mm -hmm. all I am. Yeah, yes. Sheldon, your doorman. Um, no, Eldon, your doorman. That's, that's what it is. No, the beauty of the original Clipper is that not only was it written by a 10-year-old boy, yeah. but it was typed on a manual typewriter, and you can see where he overtyped you know, mistakes because you couldn't just white it out or delete it. Yeah, you couldn't delete and, it. Yeah. And then, and then um, words that he would did not know how to spell. He didn't ask anybody to go to a dictionary. They're all spelled phonetically. And then what you see in that original mm. manuscript is how much that boy loves that dog and how because he's got he's like a, a realized stuffed animal. That dog is his lifeline to doing everything he can <clears> imagine. <throat> And um, it, Clipper takes on a different personality in the new book. It's just as good, but I loved the original. Anyway, there you go. That's my pitch for yeah, it. The original is a as the pref, preface uh, for the uh, for the book. That would be interesting. Or well, the original thinking, story, and here if, here it is in ref, you know. At, uh, yeah, if we yeah if we can make it look like something because we would just have to fifty years on it yeah. and have it look like mm. it does. But we were thinking it could be a good companion if we ever get the book finished in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, remember, 
I was going to say that I ran out of things to say, and there is a page near the end where I just totally ran out of things. I wrote was clipper, 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 clipper. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, Peter Singh is uh, viewing from the CR Foothills. Very interesting to hear David live. His recollection of his conversation with Carl Sagan did make me smile. Thank you, Scott, and Explore Scientific. Thank you, Peter. Um, Redbeard says, I remember my buddy's mind blowing when I showed him what you can see, that you can see Andromeda in binoculars. Binoculars are that's something every astronomer should own is a nice set of binoculars you know uh it's just a great absolutely place. yeah that's right absolutely you should we should own everyone should own a nice pair of binoculars in fact i've enjoyed looking at comet uh, neowise lately with my pair of binoculars which conveniently are named ophelia ophelia okay yeah the great thing about these binoculars is that they're intelligent so I find the comet and then I press this button at the top yeah. and it stabilizes them. Oh, so image stabilizing. Are they binoculars. the Canon image stabilized binoculars? They are the Canon. And Those they are the best are, ones. Those are the they best are the wonderful yeah. with a capital W and a capital L. Yeah. They are absolutely great. And worth the money. That's right. That's right. They're not that expensive. No. Ron Delbo says, a fuzzy white spot in the scope turns out to be a green ball on the camera after processing. Interesting how we see. Okay. All right. Yeah, um, yes. <laughs> Redbeard says, Eureka is a vacuum cleaner brand. I think I named my Comet Hunter. My, I think I'll name my Comet Hunter Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Satish from India says, uh, David, you have a great sense of humor. I appreciate it. Um, well, thank you. Thanks uh, for saying that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Redbeard wants to know if that is an ES 82 degree 30 on your telescope that's uh, beside you there. That is, I believe, some sort of uh, explosion. Do you mean the, uh, piece. talking about the finder? No, the eyepiece. The eyepiece is a 20 millimeter Explorer scientific under degree decoded yeah. yeah super super eyepiece yeah that's 100 degree that's great cost twice as much as the telescope no, i don't think that's so. worth it <laughs> uh actually it's like ones you got there yeah, that's uh, right. i got some back here too they're all over the place yeah. ron delvo says i hope someday we meet and have the time to chat it would be great i feel the same about you too scott well, maybe that'll happen sometime. We're going to have to let all this uh, this commotion uh, 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 come to an end, and uh, and then we will resume the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party, and you can come out and observe with with uh, David Levy and a bunch of other great people. Before you sign off, Scotty, yep. I have one more little poem to quote from. Sure. At the very end. So let me know when you want me to do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're almost to the end of the comments here. Uh, okay. Uh, Ron Dalvo said he has a cave Astrola 8 inch. You have 5.3. It's a great scope. Um, um, <clears throat> Ron Dalvo <clears throat> asks What gave you the ability to record a lot of your observing? I, so that's a very good question. I'm really glad you asked it. I started recording when I was a little kid because mm -hmm. I was taught if you don't write it down, you haven't done it. So session number one was actually on no, October 2nd, 1959. It was a partial eclipse of the sun as seen from Montreal. And uh, <clears throat> this, this morning's sun session that I just had is session 21,629 was the one I had a few hours ago to look at the sun. Oh, wow. And I saw, I saw uh, four very large but very faint prominences oh. and no spots. Excellent. Um, Tracy Prell says uh, she has a question. Comets come from the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud. 
how do we determine which region an observed comet originates from? Very good question. The Kuiper Belt comets tend to become periodic. And uh, because they come enough that each, each time they're their orbit gets a little bit closer and shorter till the point that they become periodic comets. You get a comet like Enki, or one of the ones that I found that have a period of five years or less. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Oort cloud comets tend to come once every several million years, and then they never come back, or they certainly don't come back in our lifetimes. This one, I think, is probably a com uh, an orbit, uh, Kuiper Belt comet. <clears throat> that would be my guess. Yeah. I have absolutely no evidence to back that up on. So I could be impeached for this, but <laughs> no evidence to back it up. But I think it's a Kuiper Belt comet. Well, David, this, is, uh, this has been an awesome evening. Uh, we've gone on for almost an hour and 40 minutes. Um, I really appreciate you uh, spending your time with us, and uh, I look forward to our next talk. We're already we've been talking about your next talk already. So uh, yeah, we have been. But let me finish up with Ralph Hodgson's "The Song of Honor." Okay. I stood and stared. The sky was lit. The sky was stars all over it. I stood. I knew not why. Without a wish, without a will, I stood upon that silent hill and stared into the sky until my eyes were blind with stars and still I stared into the sky. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good night, everyone, and keep looking up. Good night.